I'm Andy Newsham. Um, I am the MSc convener for uh, the MSc on Environment, Politics and Development. And this webinar is to introduce people to um, the uh, to the MSc program and to give us a chance uh, to talk about it as well. So what we're going to do today um, is look first at the Department of Development Studies within which this MSc program sits. Then I want to give you a sort of introduction to MSc Environment, Politics and Development and talk, talk you through what it's about. But I also want to give you a mini lecture which explores um, an approach called political ecology, which is right at the core of this MSc program. It's the core module, and it's the way in which we try to think through the intersection of environment, politics, and development. I've got some slides subsequent to that, which are more sort of um, structural about how the, the degree is program is structured and what your options are and what you can take, etc. And then we'll have a Q&A session at the end where you can ask me either by unmuting your microphones or um, by I'm putting little questions in the chat box and I shall field your questions as best I can. So um, let's move on to the overview of the Department of Development Studies. So in 2018, we were ranked fourth in the world uh, for development studies in the QR rankings, which is a global ranking system. We have about four to six hundred students per year. Uh, that's the postgrad numbers anyway. Um, we have more undergraduates as well. We're a, a department with 27 full-time academics. We have ex expertise across the global south. We have a very strong postgraduate focus uh, with 11 MSc degree programs. Um, we have very diverse regional and disciplinary interests, although these roughly map onto those of SOAS, which tend to be around the Middle East, um, Africa and Asia, and to a lesser extent also um, Latin America, although perhaps that's not the region of the world that we are most famous for. So the thing that you really sort of, I guess, key into if you come to do um, a degree with our department and indeed across large parts of SOAS is a commitment to critical scholarship. Um, that is, to understand you know, contemporary development models, but also really to, to question them and to cover the extent to which they have been questioned and, and in some ways very fundamentally as well. So that is, um, uh, I guess, the background, if you like, to, to, to our sort of degree program. And it's something that uh, characterizes to quite a large extent the identity of the degree. So let's just move on to that then. Um, <clears throat> Essentially, the MSc in Environment, Politics and Development is maybe very, uh, very clearly characterized in terms of its focus on critical inquiry. We're aiming to reach out to students who are seeking to explore the intersecting social, political, economic and ecological dynamics, which give rise both to global environmental change, but also to inequitable and unjust forms of development. So it's grounded, as I say, in this um, political ecology approach, and it also speaks to the broader critical environmental scholarship. It's taught by leading scholars with interest in, this air, in these areas, and we cover a range of environmental issues from water to forestry, climate, fisheries, agricultural production, biodiversity, conflict, and, and energy. And we're interested um, in the kinds of landscapes uh, and the kinds of environments which are forged by development. And if you look at these um, two landscapes here, one is the biggest open pit uh, gold mine in the world, that's in Australia, on your left hand side. And the other is the line where the um, palm oil cultivation stops in um, Palawan, one of the Indonesian islands, and where the forest um, coverage uh, starts and <laughs> it's it's that kind of intersection of environment and development if you like that we're we're very interested um, in in looking at some brief highlights of the MSc some of the things that we're really keen to sort of to delve into would be questions around the following so how does the environment intersect with global poverty wealth and questions of inequality can global environmental problems be resolved through market mechanisms like carbon trading and payments for environmental services how does access to environmental resources relate to wealth and poverty 
Is wildlife conservation implicated in social injustice? Uh, what role can and do environmental movements play in development? And is there a link between environmental change and conflict? So these are all issues, if you like, which are very much of the moment. Um, but of course, as I say, our fo our, we're very keen to see how they come together. And we're very um, uh, sort of focused on, on demonstrating how processes of environmental degradation and poverty are often linked um, through broader sort of political and economic processes. The objectives of this MSc programme are to showcase and critically engage with scholarship, which seeks to reveal the underlying processes which give rise to global environmental crisis. Uh, and there's a <laughs> random word in there. We want to um, foster a critical interrogation of policy and intervention, which claims to reconcile and deliver um, environmentally sustainable development. <coughs> and the question we really have there is, is the solution actually the problem? We have a lot of narratives which say, oh yes, sustainable development is possible. Um, and we have a lot of evidence which suggests that the contrary is actually happening. And there's something about looking at how we get to the point where we think that the modes of, of development, which we often call sustainable, actually, whether they really can be or not, if we want to get to the bottom of, of what kind of environment and development sort of intervention we might be wanting to support. So that brings me to the third point, which is that we're really encouraging students to step away from existing paradigms and arrive around, arrive at their own conclusions about what it works to, what it means to work within them. I don't want people to take for granted that the way in which things are working now uh, is the way, if we can get it right, is the way that we will um, achieve a better balance between environmental and development considerations. And uh, we want to do that partly by highlighting, interrogating and exploring alternatives to mainstream uh, environment and development thinking. Through this, we hope to give students the critical stu uh, tools to, the, to decide for themselves what needs to change in environment and development dynamics. And the prospects, I guess, ultimately, for doing this within the system, if you like, or outside of it, and to deconstruct those framings as well, because nothing's quite that simple. So that, in a nutshell, is what this degree program is about. And as I've said already, um, political ecology is an approach that we put at the heart of how we try to understand some of these issues. And this is where I want to sort of begin the mini lecture, which will give you a flavor of what we actually teach um, uh, on the MSc program. These slides are taken from a lecture that I gave only a couple of weeks ago. They're slightly adapted and there are not so many of them <laughs> as there are in that lecture, but it's to give you a flavor of what is the approach that we that we take and what does that look like? And I'll also be trying to flesh that out in the context of, um, I guess, um, specific empirical contexts so that you get some sense, not just of the approach itself, but how we would apply it to a particular place in the world. So what I wanna do is to define political ecology in brief. Um, I want to show you the areas of focus, if you like, which are in, of interest to political ecologists and how they map onto what we do in our MSc core module on the political ecology of development. I sort of want to, I guess, highlight how political ecology might not be understood as one single approach, but as a form of argument or almost like a genre, if you like, and I'll, I'll unpack what I mean by that a little bit later. And then highlight the extent to which political ecology is often very critical of contemporary environment and development processes, but entails a search for alternatives. So there is, if you like, the other side, which is looking for how do we make change, not just critiquing the sorts of change um, that we currently find ourselves enmeshed in. First of all, I want to tackle the question of why we would need an approach like political ecology. <laughs> in some ways, ecology is quite a 
<laughs> political topic and subject. Environmentalism more broadly is potentially a, a very radical project if you think about it in terms of the world that we live in. It's about prioritizing environmental quality above economic growth and we may not have got very far in uh, bringing about a greater prioritization but if you think about it the the ultimate sort of underlying objectives are are pretty much at odds with the sort of engine of development that we currently have in the form of global capitalism. So why would we need something else like political ecology to to get to grips with what's happening? What haven't we got enough already? The way that we would answer that question is to say that environmentalism can often be either apolitical or it does not have a full account of social, economic and political dynamics of human environmental interactions. And so I did a quick Google search of the word environmentalism and what images come up uh, against that. And so you see these ones that we have here. One, the top one sort of contrasts to sort of a landscape which is full of trees and lions and vultures and uh, it looks like some kind of sub-Saharan African landscape merged with <laughs> some kind of <laughs> northern European sort of crop field or something. It's it's a bit it's a bit odd. And against that, you've got the sort of urbanized, sort of industrialized, polluting sort of image that we tend to think of as something, if you like, outside of nature or in contrast to what it is that we want we want to to conserve. The thing about that is it doesn't really recognize that cities are natural environments and in fact that you could argue like some people do that it's the rest of nature that has been urbanized precisely through the demand uh, that cities and urban centers place on the world's environment 75 percent or above of all energy and resource usage revolves around uh, the populations that are are uh, resident in cities so you could say the rest of the world has been urbanized in in that sense even if it doesn't look uh, like a city then the bottom photo shows the increasing um, propensity within sort of environmental circles to think of commodifying nature in order to save it so that if you can convince people of what its its value is in in, in dollars um, then that's the way that you can you can save it. So this is all very well, but neither of these approaches to environmental really um, sort of they might recognize the environmentally damaging nature of capitalism, but they don't really try to understand why capitalism persists in spite of the huge global environmental damage and the global inequality which it is implicated in generating and if we ask those sorts of questions we might find different kinds of environments different sorts of people that we would want to do research on and we might find that they're not necessarily the ones that environmentalists or conservationists would turn their or our attention towards so on that note this is the kind of landscape this is the kind of environment it's you know it is an environment even if it's not a protected area and it's not some kind of pristine landscape untouched by or uninhabited by humans or or, or their livestock and um, this is um a part of an informal settlement in uh, in accra the capital of ghana called um agbog bloshi and this is a dump site where essentially a lot of the world's um sort of uh, spent electronic equipment and in particular computers and um, you know tablets and smartphones and stuff like that um, gets um, sent to be processed in some kind of way so copper and other materials are stripped from the computers ready to be um, you know sort of sold to put them into, into new computers or into, into other forms of technology I suppose and what you have here is this this system, if you like, which connects um, people, people who have quite incredible amounts of knowledge about the sort of chemical properties and the uses to which they can be put of, of the materials which make up computers, um, who then link to uh, a group of uh, sort of middlemen who uh, set up their shop around the edges of the, of the dump store and who um, then buy the, the, the salvaged materials um, and then there of course are the other people who are organizing for containers of old computers and, and, and 
uh, old electric equipment to be brought to the dumpster from places like China and uh, Latin America. So there's a sense in which this environment, which also um, um, it, it doesn't just uh, it's not just inhabited by humans, but also by by some of their livestock, as you can see, there's a sense in which this this environment is a sort of a visual representation of the sorts of political and economic relationships uh, and networks which which forge it. It's completely integrated into forms of global trade, even as the environmental consequences are only really felt. Um, the, the most immediate ones and the most deadly ones are only really felt by the people who work there and the people who live around uh, the dump site. And what they're what they're doing is they're in some ways they're they're informally, if you like, part of um, broader global political and economic processes. So you have um, containers of old um, electrical equipment being shipped from places like China and Latin America. So they're connected to these places. Um, and they are recycling some of these materials for use in, in other markets and, and in, in, um, in other machines, if you like. So this is the kind of environment which political ecologists would be interested in. How do these people fit into a broader sort of political economy, if you like, um, of um, resource use and in this case resource <laughs> abandonment? Um, what are the implications of that? I mean, the people who work on this dump site are not exactly uh, wealthy. And what are the environmental implications um, for uh, those sites? And as you can see, there is, um, this is not a very healthy place to live. You can see the guy wearing the, uh, the gas mask there. You can see the photo of those not very um, healthy looking uh, livestock eating, um, some of what they can find on the dump site. Um, so political ecology is really interested in making this kind of landscape much more visible because it's much more um, representative of, if you like, um, the the broader sort of conditions um, of of global capitalism as it relates to questions of poverty um, and environmental degradation. This is a a sort of uh, this is the kind of environment, if you like, that is of most interest to, to political ecologists more than, say, a pristine protected area uh, where humans are prohibited from living, although that's also a study, uh, a source of study for, for some political ecologists. Um, so I hope that gives you some sense of what do we mean by a landscape which would be interesting to political ecologists. So defining political ecology let's be very clear from the outset that political ecology is much more something that social scientists have written in than ecologists have there are some ecologists who've come over to social sciences such as human geography anthropology sociology political science etc but this is uh, a discipline which or not really a discipline but a, but an area if you like which um, is dominated by concerns and the questions of the social sciences as they imply, sorry, as they apply to the environment and what a social scientist we can and sometimes can't understand about the environment. So there are various definitions that you could start with and they often, um, I guess a lot of them are, are shaped by economic processes which often leads to a tendency to ask who wins and loses from particular um, states of affairs, who has different interests in them, how do they um, pursue those interests, to what extent are they able to uh, achieve those interests, and um, who is prejudiced by this as um, a result. That would be one definition of political economy, understanding all of those political processes as, as they affect um, broader economic processes. So um, you therefore get in political ecology um, a concern with um, <coughs> words like class, um, access, uh, control over resources, and the implications for environmental health and sustainable livelihoods, 
Another goal can be to explain environmental conflict, especially in terms of struggles over knowledge, power and practice. So here is another thing that political ecology is very much interested in. Not just what do we know about the environment, but how is the environment framed? Who classifies what kind of problem it is? Whose voices are heard within that framing? Whose voices are marginalized within that framing? And how can we get at those marginalized voices? And you can see that this then links to another goal of um, for people who uh, in the field who have been in a position to define political ecology, which is to locate movements emerging from the tensions and contradictions of under production crises, uh, understanding the imaginary basis of their positions and visions for a better life and the discursive character of their politics and sees the possibilities for broadening environmental issues into a movement for livelihood entitlements and social justice. So there are sort of normative um, if you like ethical commitments here in terms of how we study what people are doing to resist um, particular processes which are giving rise to environmental problems and to inequality and to maybe be part of that change as well. It's about the way in which political ecology then beyond just particular definitions it because there are quite a lot of people who do it in quite different ways now and emphasize different parts of it it's not really a theory or a method as such but draws on as i've said before largely social science theories around political economy feminism post-structuralism new materialism all of which you'll learn a little bit about if you come and study here and the methods of the social sciences as well ethnography uh, surveys and sometimes but less commonly um, ecological analysis this is something that the field could really work on um, there's a sort of large constituency as we've seen on the borderlands between analysis and action political ecology is both very skeptical of mainstream institutions um, involved in, in environment development processes but there are people who also work in them who are influenced by political ecology and who may be trying to change these institutions along lines that they see um, to be um, influenced, if you like, by this kind of framing. So um, there's a, if you like, at the heart of of, uh, of this, you know, it had, it depends how we understand it, but that at this sort of movement or this approach, uh, there are, you know, a shifting canon of texts, if you like, from Marx to Gramsci, Polanyi, uh, Esther Bozer up, Bandana Shiva, Michel Foucault, Gilles Deleuze, Bruno Latour, Donna Haraway, there's a, a lot of texts which are interested in the, I guess, relationship between humans and their environment and the things that happen as a result, such as in the case of Karl Marx, capitalism through the commodification of nature. It's um, the combination of na nature as it is transformed by human labor um, into products which can be exchanged in markets, which gives rise to capitalism in the first place. And in, uh, of course, the classic account by, by, by Karl Marx, someone like Bruno Latour is very interested in the underlying philosophy of how you in describe the relationship between humans and their environments. Uh, and talks about them as assemblages which are always shaping and reshaping each other so that we can't understand them separately they're too entangled and and and, and stuck together to do that i was talking about the characteristics of political ecology understood broadly as a genre if you think about sort of i don't know Okay, I'm back. So the things that they have in common, many political ecology studies like to track the persistent structures of winning and losing. There's often a focus on human and non-human dialectics, the way that they both affect and shape each other. Things often start or end in a contradiction in um, political ecology. So if we think back to Agbog Bloshi, the fact that brand new radiators are sent over to Agbog Bloshi um, to be stripped and put into new <laughs> equipment that presumably makes it its way somewhere else that isn't another dump site, but who knows? That kind of 
contradictory sort of dynamic is often a focus for political ecologists. And then there's a lot of making claims about nature and um, making claims about other people's claims about nature. So the ways in which some people represent the environment um, are sometimes challenged or at least flagged by political ecologists. An example would be there was a lot of work in the 1990s and the early 2000s which was looking at the ways in which a lot of farmers in sub-Saharan Africa had been um, blamed for all kinds of soil erosion and environmental degradation and deforestation and there were political ecologists who went in and contested those narratives and found evidence either that farmers weren't to blame or that in fact there were things that they were doing which were environmentally friendly that were being missed so if you see there you're making your own claim about nature even as you are contesting somebody else's and underlying that is a sort of I guess a concern with how do you make claims about nature? Can you make true claims about nature? Some of the theses of political ecology, if you like, the main areas of focus, one would be on degradation and marginalization, which is looking at environmental conditions. And it's just, I was giving an example of the ways in which political ecologists look at that just before. Um, <clears throat> And it links to module topics that we have in political ecology of development. We have a uh, we have a week on global environmental history. We have our, one on nature, capitalism, and political economy, on biofuel, agrarian change, and rural livelihoods. All of which, in one way, shape, or form, are, are linked to processes of degradation and marginalisation. Conservation and control: the extent to which conservation outcomes and particularly failures um, are seen as often having pernicious effects. Um, which is sometimes implicated in that failure. So if you think about the establishment of protected areas either in North America or across vast waves of um, sub-Saharan Africa, in the process of establishing areas cast as wilderness, uh, wilderness is being defined as areas where people don't live. Sometimes people were living there and were evicted and they found their livelihoods criminalized, even though arguably the state of the sort of um, environment that was deemed worthy of conservation was because of the way in which those people used it. So um, there's a lot of focus on environmental conflict and uh, exclusion in political ecology. This might be things like the resource curse, which is the extent to which countries like Sierra Leone, which have diamonds, or uh, Nigeria, which have uh, which has oil, um, suffer a kind of curse in the sense that the politics around controlling diamonds are and oil are so nasty and so awful in their um, consequences both for for people and for the environments that they live in that you know effectively end up being cursed that's the thesis we explore that in one of our classes is there a link between environmental conflict and security um, mining livelihoods and indigenous people, there are conflicts between mining companies who want to come in and work in particular areas of land and the particular indigenous groups who may already live there and have very different ideas about what they want that land to be used for. Um, there's work on environmental subjects and uh, identity, which is the extent to which people's identities are actually shaped by environmental um, thinking and that there are political identities and social struggles linked to livelihood and environmental scarcity. So this is a kind of, um, if you think about um, people, to go back to the example of Nigeria, who live in the Niger Delta, who are contesting the environmental effects of shell um, pipelines which burst and which contaminate the, the water supplies uh, in the places where they live and which have all kinds of nasty effects upon upon people. There's, a, there's an environmental struggle there but it's very much linked to, to livelihood. Um, political objects and actors, um, so socio-political conditions um, which uh, are in some cases are structured in particular ways which then produce the winners and losers persistently that we were talking about before. Um, so um, political and economic systems are shown to be underpinned and affected by non-human actors which are intertwined. So there's a whole sort of consideration, if you like, of the relationship between humans and their environments and how we're affecting each other 
um, and how that what that actually looks like. So a place like Agbog Vloshi or uh, the urban the urbanization of nature that I was talking about right at the start of the presentation. I just want to end with a, a consideration not just of being critical of current um, ways of thinking about the environment and of the political and economic conditions which give rise both to poverty, marginalization, inequality and environmental problems. But there's a concern with trying to do something about this or um, working out where you stand in relation to these um, issues. And one of the things that you're trying to do is explore alternatives and um, adaptations and creative human action in the face of mismanagement and exploitation. So it's always trying to unearth what people are doing differently, which might give us a different idea about what an environmentally sustain sustainable practice might look like, what well-being in human terms um, might depend upon other than the, uh, the commodification of nature. So there's always a concern there, as I've said before, with, with highlighting some of these alternatives and we look at some of them in the module itself. The structure of the MSc program, what you'll essentially be doing is acquiring 180 credits of, uh, of uh, across the whole of the MSc, which comprises 120 taught credits and a 60 credit dissertation. Most of this will come through taught modules, which mostly are 30 credits. But there are some 15 credit ones, so you could study four or six modules across the course of the year. Most of the teaching falls basically between well, pretty much all the teaching falls between um, October, uh, the start of October and sort of the end of March. We've just finished with our terms now. There are activities in the third term of the year, but that's when the bulk of the taught work will be. And then you have revision sessions and, and particular study skill sessions um, and maybe chats about career and what you might want to do next in combination with working full time on your dissertation in the third term and then into the summer. So there are different module types. Um, there are core ones, which the core one for this is political ecology of development. There are some compulsory ones which are here below. So you, you would choose um, two of these. Um, theory, policy and practice of development, political economy of development, political economy of violence, conflict and development, or law and natural resources. And then you have an optional module. Here are the ones from development studies, just to give you um, some sense of what, what we do. So we um, you can see some of the interests of the department here around agrarian change, for example, um, around cities, around civil society, social movements. Um, Political economy, of course, is a big one for us. Gender and development, global commodity chains. You get some sense of what I was referring to before when I was talking about the critical bent of the Department of Development Studies. That's really what our reputation sort of is, is for, I suppose. And that's really the kind of scholarship which we will get you engaged with uh, uh, if you come and study with us. If you are interested in finding out about some of the uh, optional modules you can choose across SOAS from other departments, if you click on the link there, I don't know if it will work or whether you might have to copy and paste it into your browser, um, that will take you through to the page where I've just sort of taken a bit of a photo and, and pasted it onto this slide, which gives you PDFs of all of the open options that you can take across all of the other centers and departments that we have um, in SOAS. So there's a, there's a of stuff there that you could try and get your head around. We have our first question here from Bethan, uh, which is, are there any exams? Uh, no, I've not covered that, so you haven't missed it. Um, we have, it's 100% um, uh, ass assessed by coursework, so you'll have one um, essay, well, it depends on, the, on what you take. Most of what we do in development studies now is some kind of coursework assessment. There are some modules, not very many now, but ones like political economy of development, which do have exams. OK, do you need to have a background in environmental politics for this course? What we say is that you generally need to have some kind of um, social science degree although we do have people who come across from the natural sciences we've got ecologists studying right now we've got people who've done environmental engineering and, and um, they've they're coming across because they want to get the sort of social and political side of the environmental um, expertise that they they already have 
Um, if you also have a degree, say, in the humanities or the arts, we have had people do our degrees, do this degree, but you tend then to need some kind of experience uh, or you need to be able to demonstrate to us that you understand some of the issues. Say, if you're when you're applying, there's a personal statement, that place where you can where you can do that. Does that answer your question, Fabian? Is the course available for part time students? Yes, it is. Um, you can do two or you can do three years. Um, three years is the maximum you can do it in. And I should really put that on my slides for next time, shouldn't I? That's a very, um, that's a question which will be of relevance to a lot of people who come along to this sort of webinar. So thanks for raising it, Fabian. What kind of dissertation topics that were usually written by students of environment, politics and development? Um, gosh, that's a good question. Um, they tend to be something which um, link to something they've either come to the university with and want to research more. So some, sometimes people take a break from their careers or they want to make the next step in their careers by taking an MSc like this one. 